Hello and welcome to the NPTEL MOOCs course on Economics of Health and Education. This is uh, lesson 2 in uh, week 2. Uh, we will continue with the module on microeconomics of health and education. We will look at the microeconomic foundations of uh, how uh, the microeconomic tools are used in understanding the economics of health and education. Before we begin with today's lesson, let us recapitulate what we have done in the last class. We basically asked two questions in the last class. One is what do we mean when we say health care? Uh, we, by health care, we uh, refer to a whole lot of things from physicians to medicines to hospitals to uh, non-hospital institutions to non-physician uh, workforce. Uh, we also refer to uh, rules and regulations, licensing issues that uh, are a part of the healthcare markets. So basically, uh, by healthcare, we do not just refer to medicines and physicians or hospitals, but there are a whole lot of other uh, composite uh, uh, indicators that constitute uh, health care. We also uh, looked into the issue of what are the characteristics that make the health care market unique and we saw that there were four defining characteristics. One is that the uh, illnesses or how people get sick is an extremely random event and that gives rise to a lot of uncertainty with regard to uh, uh, illnesses. And uncertainty gives rise to a lot of issues with respect to how uh, goods and services can be provided in the healthcare market. We also looked at the issue of information losses. In other words, healthcare markets deals with various kinds of goods and services that may lead to lack of information on the part of the consumers or the patients who are the receivers of uh, healthcare. Uh, we also looked at the issue of externalities. We discussed that uh, the healthcare markets may give rise to uh, various kinds of externalities in the sense that uh, the benefits of the good that is being consumed by the patient or the consumer may not just be uh, applicable to the consumer himself or herself, but there may be other unintended, unintended beneficiaries of the good as well. So in that sense, uh, it may give rise to externalities and that makes uh, um, that makes it a unique characteristic of the healthcare market. We also saw that healthcare markets requires a lot of government intervention. Governments become an important uh, uh, institution that guides uh, rules and regulations that, that guides the direction of resources within the healthcare market. So we will take this second question of unique characteristics of healthcare market a little further. We will expand this analysis by understanding how economists understand these markets and what are the reasons we say that healthcare markets has certain unique characteristic features. So for that, I have prepared this outline for today's lesson. We will look at what do we economists mean when we say markets or what is the standard definition of markets, what are the key assumptions of perfectly competitive markets. We will also see why healthcare markets do not satisfy the assumptions of perfectly competitive markets. And finally, we will with the help of all of these uh, by understanding perfectly competitive markets and the reasons why healthcare markets do not satisfy the assumptions of perfectly competitive markets, we will understand uh, that by not satisfying these conditions, healthcare markets emerge as institutions with very unique characteristics. So, what do typically economists talk about in the context of markets? Now, often you would see that uh, markets are referred to as a place where uh, buyers and sellers come together uh, to uh, discuss about their goods and services that they are offering, uh, the prices at which the goods and services are being offered and there is trading of goods and services with respect to prices. So market is any place where sellers of a particular good or service meet with the buyers and transact those goods and services. And in today's world, uh, as you would know that markets are not necessarily uh, physical places where buyers and sellers come together to buy goods and services, there may be virtual places as well, goods may be traded in the online spaces as well. So such meeting points for transactions of goods and services, whether it is a village market or it is a supermarket or an online transaction that takes place is referred to as a market. Now uh, economists often take reference to perfectly competitive markets as some kind of an ideal construct, uh, as some kind of a model in reference to which real life markets can be uh, discussed. And uh, the, as the name suggests perfectly competitive markets, it is some kind of an ideal situation which helps us to abstract 
the discussion on uh, what are the forces that determine such kinds of markets. So, at least theoretically economists desire markets to be perfectly competitive and we will see presently what these perfectly competitive markets are and also why it is important to discuss healthcare markets or for that matter education markets as well when we do it later in the course, uh, why it is important to take reference to the perfectly competitive markets. Um, now, in reality you will see that uh, we are often talking about markets from the point of view of sellers, how many sellers are present in the market. There are some distinguishing features of uh, these markets in economic theories based upon the number of sellers. You may find uh, a monopolistic market characterized by monopoly which means that there is a one seller or there may be two sellers, a duopoly, there may be a few sellers characterized as um, oligopoly or there may be um, you know a few uh, lesser than 10 to 15 sellers which may be referred to as uh, you know monopolistic competition and so on. So, there are different kinds of markets that we discuss in the context of economic theories. So, in imperfectly competitive markets which are these variations uh, the variations from the perfectly competitive markets often the understanding is that uh, sellers typically charge very higher prices on their goods than what it costs to produce them and that is one of the defining characteristics of perfectly competitive markets vis-a-vis -vis the imperfectly competitive markets and therefore such markets are not considered as perfect by the consumers because the consumer sovereignty does not prevail in these kinds of markets. It is beyond the understanding of the consumers or beyond the power of the consumers to be able to influence market prices. So, a key feature of what economists refer to as a perfect market or the market with perfect competition in is one in which there is um, large number of sellers and none of them is able to influence the price that is determined in the market. So, which means that the consumers are completely um, okay with affording the price that is presented in the market and the uh, sellers do not have any undue advantage over the price that is being offered in the market. So, that is, that is what is referred to as a perfectly competitive market. Now, this perfectly competitive market is actually a very attractive mechanism because consumers get what they want if they pay uh, for the things uh, what things cost and producers get sufficient revenues to cover their costs. So, there is in a way um, uh, consumer sovereignty which is uh, established because of competition among the sellers to be able to provide the best price to the consumers. There is harsh competition between sellers and producers and any profits over and above what is needed to keep them in business is evaporate in the long run which means that the sellers are not making any super normal profits, they are making as much profits as allows them to be in the business and uh, that immediately affects the impacts the price that is available to the consumers and uh, that also keeps the consumers happy. And this is what is referred to as the market clearing point or the equilibrium in which uh, you know, the supply equals demand and it yields a market price. And under ideal conditions uh, in a perfectly competitive market, if uh, it is a market clearing point then we say that the marginal social value of the product equals the marginal social cost and we arrive at an equilibrium where quantity produced equals quantity demanded and it is a happy situation for all for the producers as well as the consumers. Now, this perfectly competitive market to be a, this ideal construct of a perfectly competitive market uh, is based upon certain key assumptions. It does not just come about like that. There are certain key assumptions that uh, conditions that need to be satisfied for such a perfectly competitive market to uh, exist. So, what are these key assumptions? Let us look at them. Now, one of the first key assumption of a perfectly competitive market is full information. This basically tells that buyers who are the consumers of the good know how much, what and when they wish to consume as well as the quality of the goods. So, we know that a marketplace constitutes of buyers and sellers. A perfectly competitive market is that in which the buyers or the consumers or the purchasers of the goods and service have full information about the different parameters in the market. For example, they are absolutely aware about how much is available, where it is available, what is the price at which it is available. Uh, they have full information about the market conditions and that also there is an inherent assumption of this, an inherent uh, feature of this assumption is that consumers are rational human beings, they are 
educated human beings who are absolutely aware and fully informed about the market conditions prevailing. So, that is one of the first uh, assumptions and the rationality assumption is a very important assumption to be made in perfectly competitive markets where the, the rational consumer is able to make a perfect choice or an optimal choice with regard to what she must buy and by how much she must buy and what is the price she is paying in the marketplace. Uh, that is a very important assumption to have. The second assumption in a perfectly competitive market is that there is impersonal transactions in the sense that the buyers and sellers have absolutely no uh, connect with each other uh, or influence over each other. So, the buyers and sellers are acting independently and they are making a choice very rationally. So, the sellers uh, cannot influence the buyers in any non-price manner. So, there can be the, there can be no way how the sellers can take advantage of the consumers by providing extra information or by providing any extra information about other sellers or the marketplace. So, in that sense, we, in the perfectly competitive market condition, we are mostly referring to impersonal transactions and the buyers and sellers are absolutely independently acting on their own self-interest. So, the consumer is guiding her own self-interest and the producers are guiding their own self-interest because they are interested in getting the right price and the consumers are interested in getting the right commodity by paying the right price. The third assumption is that of private goods. In a perfectly competitive market, the buyers and sellers are transacting private goods and services in the sense that the person consuming the good is affected by it and that person pays for all the social costs and gains of the uh, gains all the social benefits. Now, in economics, we make this distinction between private goods and public goods and I will presently come to this distinction between private goods and public goods and it is important in the context of it holds a lot of significance in the context of health and education markets because um, health and education are a bundle of goods that distinctly differ from other goods and services which are traded in the uh, in the marketplace which has public good characteristics in the sense that the benefits that we derive out of uh, healthcare markets, uh, healthcare goods and services or education are not just ours own but there are significant externalities that influences other consumers as well. So, in a perfectly competitive market, the assumption is that we are only transacting private goods and services or private goods. So, which means that if I am buying a telephone, a, a mobile phone in the market, then the benefit that I derive out of that mobile phone is mine only and nobody else can get any benefit out of it. Um, so, but in the case of public goods, uh, if we are paying for the provision of some public good, it may be possible that there are other consumers as well. Uh, who are getting some benefit out of it um, and therefore, th this distinction is very important. The fourth assumption is that the buyers are guided by, uh, the buyers and sellers are guided by selfish motivation. Now, this may sound very objective, uh, but the fact remains that this is guided by the rationality assumption, the consumers are rational which means that the consumers are as I said earlier that the consumers are acting in their own best interest and the producers are also acting in their own best interest. So, the buyers are only in the market for their own satisfaction or because they are getting some utility of the out of the goods that is being transacted in the market and similarly, the sellers are in the market only for the with the profit motive. So, the motivation that guides the buyers and sellers in a perfectly competitive market is very clearly defined. The consumer is in the market because uh, he or she uh, derives utility out of the good and therefore, will experience some amount of satisfaction while consuming the good and the seller is in the market because uh, he or she may uh, gain a profit out of the sale uh, um, proceeds that uh, takes place in the marketplace. The fifth assumption is that a perfectly competitive market has to be imagined in such a manner that there are many buyers and sellers. There are a whole lot of buyers and sellers in the market and therefore, because the numbers are so large, no single buyer or single seller can influence the market price nor can they collude with each other in a coordinated manner to influence the price in the marketplace. And this is where we make the distinction between the other forms of uh, imperfectly competitive markets that I discussed in the beginning of the class where we spoke about monopoly, duopoly or uh, oligopolistic uh, markets 
where many uh, where a few sellers may collude and then influence the market price but that doesn't happen in the case of um, uh, perfectly competitive markets a sixth assumption of the perfectly competitive markets is that anyone who likes to sell the products can start to do so and anyone who wants to leave the market can uh, can do so so there is free entry and exit into the marketplace there are no boundations with respect to uh, who can or cannot enter the marketplace particularly in the context of the sellers the buyers are of course also free to enter the market to make a decision or a choice with regard to what to buy because there is consumer sovereignty in a perfectly competitive market but as far as the sellers are concerned there is nothing there is no licensing or there is no regulation on the part of any authority that can uh, bar the entry or become a barrier to the entry of the seller so there is free entry and free exit all sellers are in the marketplace with a profit motive if they have the capacity and possibility of earning profits they remain in the market but if somehow they uh, cannot earn profits they are free to exit the market finally the perfectly competitive markets uh, are based upon the assumption that the sellers are selling homogeneous product in the sense that there is not much product differentiation uh, in the uh, products that the sellers are selling so the buyers actually cannot distinguish any difference between the products of the different producers or sellers and that is one of the reasons why the sellers cannot influence the price in the market because there is not much product differentiation or any product differentiation for that matter there is intense competition among the sellers and the price is settled at a stable rate and therefore the consumers are able to know what is the price that they want to pay for the uh, product so these are the seven key assumptions of a perfectly competitive market now we'll look at uh, the details of each of these assumptions and then we will assess each of these assumptions in the context of a healthcare market and see whether or not the healthcare market or the nature of the healthcare market is such that whether they qualify these assumptions of the perfectly competitive market or not so now the healthcare market um, as we have seen in the last class that there are these unique features of healthcare market we want to at least discuss that healthcare markets do not satisfy the perfectly competitive market assumptions there are not many real world markets that completely satisfy all the assumptions of perfect competition anyway and the reasons why imperfect markets may still be favored is that they are believed to work better than an alternative with public regulation and public ownership so there are these two extremes of perfectly competitive markets where there is absolutely no government intervention and buyers and sellers are transacting in the marketplace based upon their own uh, rationality the information that they have about uh, goods and services and in the other extreme we have the government uh, controlled market and in between we have a large spectrum of uh, different kinds of markets depending upon the number of sellers in the market and also the number of buyers in the market and these the spectrum of uh, different kinds of markets in between the middle are what is referred to as the imperfectly competitive markets now in reality we do not really see a perfectly competitive uh, market mechanism but generally it is preferable that markets function efficiently therefore we see different kinds of imperfectly competitive markets so um, we can think of a real world markets ranging from as i said uh, almost perfect to almost imperfect and the market for health and healthcare stands out as being almost completely imperfect because it does not satisfy any of the assumptions as specified in the perfectly competitive markets so let's look at uh, the first assumption which is that of uh, full information now we have already seen uh, the assumptions of the perfectly competitive market and when we said that uh, the buyers have uh, full information or that the buyers know about how much to produce when to produce and where to produce we are basically clearing off any kind of uncertainty in a perfectly competitive market so buyers can predict how much they want to buy and when so there is no uncertainty involved but the very basic nature of healthcare markets which is dependent upon illness or sickness suffered by an individual is that the event of falling sick itself is uncertain it's a random event and so if the event of falling sick is uh, uncertain or is a random event so then obviously the patient or the consumer 
who is consuming the products of the healthcare market is not really prepared to make the um, expenditure that he or she wants to make in the healthcare market. So, he, is, uh, he or she is in a state of uncertainty all the time. Uh, therefore, uh, the consumer can never plan as to what to buy in the healthcare market because the event of sickness itself is a highly uh, random and uncertain event. Secondly, related to this is the fact that in a healthcare market, a patient or the consumer of healthcare can never be perfectly informed about the market conditions, cannot have full information about the product um, and therefore that may not lead to a situation of perfectly competitive markets. The distinction between these two issues is important in the context of healthcare. One I have already explained uncertainty in sickness and health and therefore because of uncertainty there is a corresponding uncertainty about what should be the line of treatment when a person suffers from a sickness. So, um, similarly planning the expenditure on healthcare even over a relatively short period of time may become impossible for a patient consumer if the illness or the sickness comes at a time when the patient is absolutely not ready to um, make that uh, expenditure uh, for himself or herself. So, patients or the buyers of healthcare lack information about the uh, expected effects that various types of healthcare may have on health which is why we as patients or consumers of healthcare always seek doctors or physicians who in a way we can say are the sellers of healthcare, not necessarily sellers of products, but they are definitely the agents through which we go seeking healthcare. So, they are on the supply side as far as healthcare supply is concerned. And this is what is referred to in health economics as information asymmetry, which means that you have a consumer and you have a supplier of healthcare, the consumer is at the receiving end as far as the healthcare market is concerned because you are not aware about your sickness, you do not know about what you are diagnosed with or how you will be diagnosed, you do not know about the treatment line as far as your sickness is concerned. So, that means you do not lack entire information about the disease that you are suffering from and therefore, you are dependent on one of the agents of the uh, supply side of the healthcare market which is the physician and this is referred to as information asymmetry. So, asymmetric information exists when one party possesses more information than the other. So, in this case the party that possesses more information is the physician or the doctor and when this information is considered important to the latter. So, the information about my sickness and my line of treatment, my diagnosis is important for me but I am not in a position to be able to carry these out in the healthcare market because I, I do not have the specialization required or the knowledge required to be able to get this information. So, I am absolutely dependent upon another uh, person who is invariably is the is a part of the sellers, um, sellers side who is the doctor here. So, doctors possess two types of information that are important to patients. One is diagnostic information as in what is wrong with the patient and second is they also contain information about the treatments, what can be done for the patient. So, consequently a patient would want her doctor to act as her, uh, as her perfect agent. So, if I go to a doctor, uh, I want to know about what is wrong with me and I do not possess full information about uh, my uh, diseases or uh, sickness that I am suffering from but the other person has more information about uh, me than I do. So, in the best interest of my uh, good health, I would request the doctor to be to act as an agent on my behalf and this is referred to as an agency relationship in the healthcare market. The patients cannot act on their own which means there is no consumer sovereignty in a healthcare market. The consumers cannot decide anything about himself or herself in the healthcare market. She has to take the help of the physicians or a whole lot of people who are associated with the physicians and this defines an agency relationship uh, which is referred to as when one individual which is understood as when one, one individual or group acts on behalf of another individual or group. So, a doctor can act as an agent in two distinct ways solely for an individual patient or many other patients alongside the patient because obviously the doctor physician is not just looking at one uh, consumer phys, uh, or patient but is looking at a lot of patients. So, here a doctor may be acting as an agent for a group of uh, patients. 
or the doctor can also act on behalf of a third party payer such as the government, a company or a society as a whole. Uh, and therefore, the uh, importance given to uh, physicians or people who have knowledge within a society uh, is uh, very high. So, in the case of an education market for example, the importance given to uh, teachers or uh, people who have the knowledge uh, to be able to teach students is given a lot of importance. So, students who are the consumers of education cannot move out of educational institutions unless they come in touch with the uh, educators or teachers or professors uh, and therefore, uh, the consumers of education, the students are by definition have uh, lack of information or less information than the uh, teachers themselves. So, that in a way uh, explains to us the unique characteristic of a healthcare market and, a, and an education market by taking example of perfectly competitive markets. Now, the second assumption is that of uh, impersonal transaction. Now, this assumption means that buyers have the same level of trust and confidence on all the sellers. As we discussed earlier that in a perfectly competitive market, buyers have full information and there is intense competition among all sellers, products are not differentiated with each other and the buyers are rational uh, consumers uh, basically. So, in that sense and, and, and they are all acting, both the parties are acting in their self-interest. So, the transaction that we uh, see in the case of perfectly competitive markets are impersonal. But in healthcare, as we have just discussed that there is agency relationship and there is lack of information or information asymmetry, the impersonal transaction between the buyer and the, um, and the seller is almost impossible. So, the transactions between buyers and sellers are personal and their relationship will be largely based on trust because the doctors or the physicians are acting as agents of the patients here and there is already information asymmetry as far as the and the patient consumers are at the receiving end. And so, the notion of impersonal transaction is not an appropriate description of the doctor patient uh, relationship. And in the market for healthcare, it is said that rather than operating at arm's length, as we have seen in the case of perfectly competitive market, buyers and sellers are almost hugging one another because there is a lot of dependency as far as the patient and the doctors are concerned. Now, the third assumption is uh, that of private goods. As I mentioned that uh, perfectly competitive markets are mostly transacting private goods and uh, private goods are those goods which are completely excludable and which are rival in consumption, you know. Uh, so, for example, uh, as I said, I took the example of the mobile phone. So, if I have purchased a mobile from the phone from the market by paying for it, then it is my property. The property right is very neatly delineated. Nobody else can use that mobile phone. So, it is an excludable product and it is a, a rival product. So, if I am if I am using it, I am excluding all others from using it. Often we take the example of a pizza or a hamburger in economics where if I am purchasing a pizza, piece of pizza and I am consuming it, then it is a perfect example of a private good where it is where I am excluding all others from consuming it because I have bought it for myself and I am consuming it and similarly rival as well because if I have consumed it of course it is not available for anybody else's use. But let us say we take the example of a street light where uh, if I am walking uh, on a street and the street light gives me light and I am getting utility out of it and there is another person or a group of other persons who are walking the same road and they are also getting utility out of the light that uh, emanates from the, uh, from the street light. Then this is an example of a public good where my utilization of the good does not exclude anybody else from the utilization of it. So, it is an example of non-excludable good as well as a non-rival good. There is no rivalry as far as the use of that good is concerned. So, in a perfectly competitive market, we are transacting private goods and uh, uh, goods are private when only the person consuming the good is affected by it, but public goods can be jointly consumed. And healthcare market is a market where we have many examples of joint consumption. There are private goods in the healthcare market as well, but in the case of uh, like if I am buying a medicine, then obviously the that medicine that I am buying is a private good, 
because of course when I am consuming it, it is not available for anybody else. I am excluding others from buying that good because uh, it is I am paying a price for it. But there are many examples of uh, goods and services sold in the healthcare market which can be jointly consumed. Now one of the examples that we often take in health economics is that of vaccinations. We know that you know when you are if there is an infectious disease uh, ongoing and if uh, one person gets vaccinated we are uh, we are saving a whole lot of people from getting the disease because I am vaccinated. So this is a case of joint consumption the benefits of the vaccine is being jointly uh, consumed. So public goods are characterized by uh, as I said non rivalry uh, characteristic and non excludability non rivalry meaning that consumption of the good by one person does not preclude it, its consumption by another I have taken the example of street lights and non excludability meaning that individuals can receive the benefits of a good without having to pay for it or there can be joint consumption of the good example vaccinations. And typically when users do not have an incentive to pay for a public good such goods are under provided you know we say that in a perfectly competitive market or even if we do not bring in the discussion of perfectly competitive market but when we are discussing a transaction of private goods the private goods are being transacted in the market because the consumers who are buying those goods and services have revealed their preference for that good and therefore they are quoting a price for that good. So that good is being auctioned in the market based upon the price that the consumer is quoting for that good. And uh, therefore then the, there is no problem of valuation of that private good. But in the case of a public good because we have seen that there can be joint consumptions and not everybody will reveal their preferences of the good then it is totally possible that that public good is being under provided. So when a public good which has such social benefits is being under provided somebody else has to do the provision and that is where governments come in and if you remember the unique characteristics of the health market which we had discussed in the last class this is the reason why governments need to intervene in healthcare markets and the education markets. So the healthcare markets does not completely satisfy the private goods assumption of the perfectly competitive markets as well. The fourth is uh, selfish motivation where we have seen that in perfectly competitive markets consumers and uh, sellers are working on their self motivation consumers because of the satisfaction that they want to derive out of a commodity, uh, sellers because of the profit motive that they are guided by. So when selfish motivation does not govern people in all walks of life this assumption makes sense for describing much of our behavior in the marketplace. Consumers buy goods simply because goods give them utility and producers sell goods because it um, gives them a profit. So consumers and producers appear to behave quite differently in the healthcare market though that they, they need not necessarily be guided by selfish motivations. Patients may not be so selfish that they disregard any concern with how their condition impacts other people and rarely if ever we come across doctors. Uh, which would doctors say that they practice medicine so as to maximize profits. Now there may be situations in a market where there is, uh, there is a lot of corruption among the doctors or they um, take advantage of the oath, uh, the Hippocratic oath that they have taken. So there are uh, uh, examples of that but generally uh, the profession of medicine or the physicians who are involved in the medicine profession uh, are not usually guided by the profit maximization motive. And even if they did there is a code of professional ethics that guides them and restricts them from doing so. So the by definition the people involved in uh, the healthcare markets uh, particularly the physicians, the nurses and so on and so forth are guided by professional ethics that does not allow them to follow the objective of profit maximization and similarly because illness is an uncertain event, it is a random event. So uh, consumers or patients do not have full information about their health conditions and that may impact the decision making in the market. So they are neither are the patient consumers guided by a selfish motive of being completely oblivious to how their health condition impacts the others or not. So the selfish motivation characteristic of the perfectly competitive health markets is also not met in the case of the healthcare markets. The uh, fifth assumption that we saw in the case of perfectly competitive markets is there are large numbers of buyers and sellers who are participating in a perfectly competitive market. And 
the reason why we consider the price that is prevailing in a perfectly competitive market as a just price is because no single buyer or no single seller can influence the price prevailing in the market. So, when a single actor cannot influence the market price either alone or through coordinated actions, they become what is referred to as price takers rather than price makers. So, they face the price in the market and they just have to accept the price that is prevailing in the market. There can be no further negotiation because the competition in the market has already uh, brought about a price which does not provide any super normal profits to the uh, sellers. Now, let us look at this uh, assumption in the context of healthcare markets. We know that there are certainly many buyers of healthcare, in most cases, they operate sufficiently independently of one another, but the number of independent sellers will vary. Uh, we will see in big cities that there are many hospitals, uh, general practitioners, and specialists might be found in large numbers and may compete with each other in attracting patients. But rarely do we observe such competition being exercised for lowering of prices. So, competition for lowering of prices of healthcare products does not really happen in the case of uh, healthcare markets. Uh, so, as can be judged from the assumption of many buyers and sellers, the market for healthcare then turns out to be uh, an imperfect one. Uh, the sixth assumption uh, we have seen in the case of perfectly competitive markets is that of free entry and exit. We have seen that uh, the sellers are free to enter and exit. Uh, there are no special uh, uh, rules and regulations that uh, bar their entry into the perfectly competitive markets, but that may not be so in the case of healthcare markets. And it is not very hard to imagine uh, uh, why this is so in the healthcare markets because we have seen that to be able to come out as a doctor or a nurse in a healthcare market, the professionals who comprise the healthcare market, there is a lot of uh, licensing procedures, there are a lot of rules and regulations that guide their education in the healthcare market and it takes long years of investment. Of, uh, of, of staying in education to be able to come out as professionals in the healthcare market and that itself becomes a barrier to entering the healthcare market. Um, for example, if you go to a local uh, market where there are vegetable sellers, uh, anybody who is able to uh, sell vegetables can enter the market. They do not need much investment in, in terms of procuring knowledge to be able to uh, enter the market. But in the case of healthcare and education markets, there is a very uh, long gestation period in the sense of having investments in education uh, to be able to come out as professionals in the healthcare market and that itself acts as a barrier. So, the opportunity for new providers to step into a market is important in order to maintain cost efficiency. And for healthcare, there are professional regulations that prohibit non-medics from offering their services. In addition, there are um, uh, certain types of uh, professional qualifications that are required in most countries for practitioners to receive public funding. And even if they might be prepared to uh, rely on patient payments, many countries regulate the number of pra various practitioners in any region. So, as in most markets, there is free exit in, in that doctors may stop practicing whenever they want to, but uh, there is certainly no free entry into the market without uh, adhering to the uh, rules and regulations uh, that are prescribed by the uh, government and uh, licensing practices of the government and uh, not just doctors and nurses there are uh, pharmacists there are ph pharmacy where you know it is required to follow various guidelines of the government to be able to sell medicines in the market so these are what we refer to as barriers to free entry and exit uh, in the uh, healthcare markets now Finally, let us look at the assumption of homogeneous products. We have seen in the case of perfectly competitive markets that products are largely undifferentiated. So, they are most the sellers are mostly selling homogeneous products of uh, similar uh, make and quality and therefore, the consumers do not have much choice with regard to um, moving from one seller to the other because wherever they go to they find similar or the same kind of uh, product being uh, sold. But that may not be so in the case of the health market. Uh, when the products from different sellers are indistinguishable to the buyers, it becomes impossible for one seller to charge a higher price also. Uh, thus, the scope for making profits by increasing the price or having a price advantage is almost impossible in a perfectly competitive market. 
Now, a common strategy for producers in modern markets is to attempt to make their products appear distinguishable by product differentiation and through brand names and packaging, effective marketing makes consumers perceive the quality to be superior which makes them willing to pay more. Uh, bottled water brands are one for example, there are different brands of uh, bottled waters and because of uh, the uh, packaging of some of the bottles, the prices may be different although the content contained in the water bottle may just be the same. So, the same type of product differentiation can be observed in the case of healthcare markets. Uh, although the chemical substance of a generic drug is identical uh, with that of a patented drug that is they are homogeneous products in that sense, the different producers use distinguishable brand names. So, that is another way of incorporating product differentiation in the case of uh, drugs for example. Now, there may be marketing attempts to make patients believe that a higher price is a signal of a more effective drug and this is carried out uh, extensively in the healthcare market. Uh, where during the COVID period you may have seen that there were various kinds of vaccinations that had uh, started coming into the market. Uh, some said that one vaccine is more uh, fruitful than the other, uh, some will have bear more results or less results than the other. So, that was one form of product differentiation uh, that is a usual practice in the healthcare markets which may not be so in the case of perfectly competitive market. In fact, in the context of healthcare, there is something called the placebo effect, which is a non price uh, effect in the healthcare market. Uh, an astonishing study showed that an expensive placebo was more effective than a cheaper one. So, the placebo here basically refers to a non medicine intervention where the patient is made to believe that a better medicine with a higher price. Uh, is uh, given to you and that will have more impact, but in reality it is a placebo and that is seen to have improved health outcomes of the patients. So, in this study by uh, S. P. et al. in 2014 uh, titled as placebo effect of medication cost in Parkinson disease, a randomized double blind study uh, when comparing two groups of patients, those who were told that their drug was very expensive. Uh, performed better in the final clinical tests. So, placebo effect or the non price competition can also have um, an impact on the health outcomes of people is what studies tell us. Similarly, by including attractive amenities, private hospitals, physicians also attempt to make patients believe that their services are of a superior quality than those of public providers. And again, uh, this is also not very hard to imagine for us where we have seen that uh, there are better facilities available in private hospitals than in government hospitals. For example, there may be a better room available, there may be better services available and these are also different ways of bringing about product differentiation when it comes to selling, uh, selling uh, hospital facilities in the healthcare market. So, non price competition, but one must understand that non price competition is only possible if patients perceive the services provided by different hospitals or doctors to be different. So, in a, a healthcare market, while uh, providers or the sellers hold um, a lot of importance in the healthcare market because uh, they have more information about what is being sold and what are the channels through which products and services are being sold. But a lot also depends upon the buyers or the patients themselves with regard to uh, what they are uh, buying into. When we carry out analysis in the healthcare markets, we also look at different segments of consumers or different segments of patients and what is the health seeking behavior of different segments of the population when it comes to seeking treatment. And therefore, we have seen uh, in many studies that um, poorer households or people who lack the ability to pay and also people who have uh, lower socio-economic attainments, uh, let us say low levels of education attainments are mostly dependent upon the public sector um, uh, hospitals or, or public doctors because they are not able to differentiate the, the information asymmetry is more acute in the case of people who are less educated or have uh, low socioeconomic credentials. So, when patients uh, like consumers can be manipulated to believe that expensive services are of a superior quality, there certainly exist genuine quality differences uh, across uh, different providers and such real differences 
uh, like some doctors may have better skills, some doctors may have better specializations, uh, some uh, specializations may be available in a certain region, but not. Uh, we have seen in India that there are certain regions within India which provide better uh, medical facilities than other regions. So, uh, uh, such real differences in seemingly similar services are however hard for lay people to identify as I just mentioned and therefore the assumption of homogeneous products is not satisfied in the market for healthcare. In fact, healthcare is one of those imperfect markets where there is uh, for seemingly similar kinds of products also there is large scale product differentiation. So, this is also an assumption which the healthcare markets do not satisfy. So, now I have come to the end of this uh, lesson now. We have seen that there are these uh, key assumptions of perfectly competitive markets and we have seen that the healthcare markets, the reasons as to why the healthcare markets do not satisfy the assumptions of the perfectly competitive markets. And since none of the seven assumptions listed in uh, the slide number seven uh, would hold for describing healthcare markets in general. Therefore, the healthcare market gives rise to uh, certain unique characteristics as we have discussed in the last class also and I am summarizing them uh, here now. Uh, so, one is uncertainty, uh, there is a lot of uncertainty surrounding illnesses, consequently there is a lot of uncertainty surrounding diagnosis of the illness, what will be the treatment line. So, the uh, consumer here who is the patient. Uh, is at the receiving end as far as information is concerned and therefore, this is a situation where there is a lot of information asymmetry or information loss and um, uncertainty gives rise to asymmetric information. One of the ways in which um, the healthcare markets try to deal with the problem of uncertainty is through health insurance. So, you buy a health insurance because uh, illness is a random event and there is a lot of uncertainty surrounding it. So, in the event that you fall sick, you will have had some guarantee of being able to deal with your illness in the form of insurance and that is how insurance is sold in the market. So, it provides some kind of a solution. Asymmetric information, we have already understood this very well. Now, one of the ways in which uh, asymmetric information can be dealt with is by sensitizing the providers or regulating the providers. So, which is why the professional code of ethics is uh, one of the important ways in which uh, the information asymmetry is taken care of because it is the duty of the physician doctors or the duty of medical professionals to explain to people. Um, they are not just sellers of healthcare, but it is their moral duty to be able to explain the patients uh, about what healthcare services are being provided to them or what they should be using. In fact, today there is a lot of emphasis on uh, citizens charters or citizens right with respect to healthcare. We know that health is a human right, the universal declaration of human rights um, considers health as a human right. So, as much as health is a human right, there is a duty associated on the part of providers to provide full information to the uh, patients with regard to their sickness, their illness or the treatment that they should be receiving. Uh, we have seen that externalities may arise in the case of healthcare markets. Uh, somebody suffers from a viral disease that may lead to, um, uh, to unintended costs within the market where people who were otherwise not exposed to the risk may also be exposed if not contained uh, uh, on time. Similarly, vaccinations may give rise to benefits to other people who may not have purchased the vaccine and to protect themselves from a disease. Uh, so, externalities may arise and if externalities arise in the healthcare market, there are various ways in which it can be internalized. So, there are different types of regulations, subsidies, in case of a negative externality there can be taxes, in the case of positive externalities there may be subsidies or there may be free distribution of medicines as well. Like we have seen in the case of iron and folic acid tablets where there is free distribution because of externalities and so on, we will discuss these later in this course. And then finally, the role of government, we have seen that because of the fact that the healthcare market does not uh, qualify the assumptions of perfectly competitive markets, there is lack of information, uh, there is a, um, a lot of product differentiation, uh, health is a human right and so on and so forth. So, it becomes imperative for the government to intervene sometimes in the form of taxes, sometimes in the form of more spending, sometimes in the form of regulation. 
a uh, large part of this uh, uh, lesson today I have taken from the textbook Principles in Health Economics and Policy. Uh, chapter 3 of this book uh, is recommended for this uh, lecture. Uh, it is titled What Makes the Market for Healthcare Different? Uh, it is a 2017 edition textbook by Jan Abel Olsen. Uh, so, I would encourage the readers if possible to get this textbook to be able to understand these issues. However, if in case you do not have access to the textbook, the slides presented in this lesson will suffice uh, for you. So, uh, in the next uh, lesson, we will continue with the microeconomic foundations of healthcare with a new topic. Thank you. Mm -hmm.